We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Live podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit Podcast. I am very, very excited about starting our book today, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, and sorry, Gary, but I'm in love with Frederick Douglass as a person. He's truly an amazing person, and I really can't wait to tell you all about him. Secondly, as you may remember from our earliest episodes when we were trying to brag on ourselves, for a lot of my career, I've been an AP language teacher, not necessarily a literature teacher. And yes, there's a difference. When you study language at the high school level, what you're actually studying is rhetoric. And rhetoric is the art of persuasion. We look at texts, fiction, but mostly nonfiction, honestly, and we study how to be more persuasive and the techniques writers use to move us emotionally and also intellectually. Well, Frederick Douglass is one of the most gifted practitioners of rhetoric in the American canon. He stands alongside the greats, Thomas Jefferson and Martin Luther King, maybe Abraham Lincoln. Uh, If you want to go for a parallel on the other side of the Atlantic, he kind of parallels the rhetoric of Winston Churchill or Martin Luther, there's just no underestimating his ability to communicate. I agree, and I totally agree that um, a new book is exciting, and this book is particularly exciting because just as you've talked about being an AP language teacher, I've been an AP United States history, an AP U.S. government teacher, I think since probably about the time that Frederick Douglass uh, died. <laughs> So, well, you're old. <laughs> uh, I feel like it sometimes. Anyway, for decades, uh, I've taught th- that topic. And what's really fun for me, I love the 1830s, the 1840s. It was just such a period of rapid intellectual growth, of cultural growth, of physical growth of the United States. It was the um, kind of the, the the democracy that had been born during the revolution was slowly coming into uh I guess late puberty. I don't know. It was emerging. It was growing. It was changing. And Frederick Douglass steps right into the middle of this and says some of the most profound things uh, about American culture. He's one of the great observers of American culture at that time period. And he writes these books. And I want to point out some of his contemporaries because his contemporaries will make him appear to be even larger than he already is. So at the time period that Frederick Douglass is writing and doing speeches and being involved in the anti-slavery movement, his contemporaries are people like Thoreau and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and William Lloyd Garrison and Nathaniel Hawthorne of Scarlet Letter fame, which was the first yes. book we ever covered. He's a contemporary of... Uh, of this time period. We've got Harriet Beecher Stowe, Charles Darwin, um, Charles Dickens, Louisa May Alcott. This is the company that he was keeping during this time period. But what's amazing is the company that he was keeping during this time period, he floats to the top of these that's great true. writers. And I think it's worthy to note, you know, for if you're a person that's just beginning to study American history and American literature, Remember that our country isn't all that old. You know, we're just a a new country and we have all these ideas about what it means to be free and and, uh, these ideals of liberty. And we're not really executing them in a fair way. As we look back in history, that becomes very obvious. Uh, And this period of history is when America really starts to have some difficult conversations. And Frederick Douglass is an important voice. And I've said this about a couple of books uh, 
and but he just stands out. Well, it's really important in American history to add this idea. When Frederick Douglass is writing, the United States is, let me put it in these terms, one generation old. So when we have the revolution in 1776, when our independence finally in 1783, we go out the process of eventually writing a constitution in 1787. And then by the time Frederick Douglass is writing his foundational works, the country is 70 years old. So this whole idea of democracy was completely, uh, or Republican democratic style form of government that we're going to experiment with was only formed in one lifetime before Douglass. So Uh, I always like to throw out this idea of the arrogance of the present. You can't judge a historical period only from the lens of the historical period you are currently living in. It skews your interpretations. It leads to revisionism. But what I want to point out is that Douglas is in the heart of the brand new beginning of this whole experiment called the United States. Well, it was published in 1845 and was an instant bestseller. And to me, that's to our American credit. You know, slavery was being practiced all over the world, and it had been for thousands of years. But in two years, this book sells 11,000 copies, and it actually comes out in nine editions. Three years later, it sold 30,000 copies, and now we've jumped the ocean. It's being printed in England France, and Germany. So it's remarkable for a lot of reasons, but I want to talk about some of my favorites kind of off the top. It didn't become a hit because Douglas sunk down to the base details of slave life. Now, this matters for several reasons. We read it today and you think, because we're about sensationalism in, in America, and we talk about, you know, the gruesome stories are the ones that are going to lead the front page. And he could have done that and led with a lot of gory details of what life as a slave was like. And he does do that. He could have talked about rape, violence, murder, beatings with such accuracy and imagery that at the time his audiences would grimace and the women would cry, of course. And uh, those are part of the story. But that's not really his purpose. There is nothing in this book that is not deliberate. It's not the essence of the story. He is constructing an argument. And he's going to rely on his ability to persuade you, not just your heart for the moment that he's talking, but your mind, not just that slavery is brutal and bad and that slaveholders are bad people, but he's going to explain why that they're bad and how it is bad and it is the power of his arguments more than the gruesome details that he goes through that is able to mold the minds of Americans and I want to say there's one very famous American who became his close friend and who he became a personal advisor and that's Abraham Lincoln Oh, heard of that guy Yeah, you may have So <laughs> how can a man and this is what amazes me He didn't even know his own birthday, and he was raised, and he was told that he was an animal. How did he rise to such phenomenal heights? This is the story that he's going to tell, and it's inspirational because he's trying to suggest that he is not special. Of course, he is, but he says that he isn't, that he's one of us. And in his words, how a slave can become a man, it's brilliant, it's articulate, it's poetic, He uses more poetry tropes and schemes than a lot of modern day poets do. But more than everything else, it's compelling. He teaches us. Exactly. And that's exactly why he stands out. You used a great phrase there. He molded the minds of Americans during this time period. And he was very influential in shaping the American cultural mind. The key to U.S. history is is looking at change over time. Any number of events occur during a time period. But when you have somebody who comes along and they enact or affect so much cultural change, then they become historically important. So when we teach history, you're looking for political, economic, and social change over time. And Frederick Douglass certainly commands every bit of that. And what he's going to do is he's going to create... um, a discussion and a level of rhetoric and logic that has to be dealt with. He's going to basically say, I'm a human. I know I'm a human because I can speak and I can reason. 
And out of that will spring everything else intellectual that's going to follow in his arguments. And that appealed to, to people in the, the North during this time period. Well, and it appeals to us today. Ralph Waldo Emerson remarked in his representative man that there is properly no history, only biography. And what he means is that the lives of important people chronicle human events. This is more than dates and battle statistics and political political statements. It's in the lives when they're fleshed out that we understand ourselves, our history, our future, and it comes together for us. And that's exactly what uh, Frederick Douglass does. Right. And one of the important things about studying history, especially individuals, we look at the idea, did a movement create the individual or did the individual create the movement? Most of the times, the movement creates the individuals. The right people show up as the social forces are there. That certainly applies to Frederick Douglass. But he also is the other side of the coin. He helped create the movement. And it's not very many historical figures that actually get to be the creator. True. And uh, I want to point out, I want us to go through very quickly his life, and then we'll get into uh, his writings. He really wrote mostly speeches. He did. And before we do that, I want to talk about throw this out because we're going to be talking about his work. Some of the isms that were competing with him during this time period, feminism was on the rise. Transcendentalism was a a key element during this time period. Expansionism, uh, as we've talked about in another podcast about the Scarlet Letter, a lot of these ideas come out of the burned over district in upper New York state in Rochester. And it's just a fascinating combination of women's rights and anti-slavery movements. So there's a lot going on. And even in the midst of one of the most socially active time periods in U.S. history, he's going to emerge and come out on top. And I would like to point out that a few years ago, we had the opportunity to uh, be uh, fellowship members of a National Endowment for the Humanities trip. And we got to go to Rochester, New York, and we were able to study uh, Frederick Douglass and the feminist movement, they're all in that same town. So we've stood in front of the, the, the publishing office of Frederick Douglass North Star. We've been to his grave. We've been to Elizabeth Cady Stanton's home and, and all the other uh, leaders of that time period. So it's really unusual that so much generated out of one part of the country at that time period. It's unusual, but I don't know why it's unexpected. You know, we were saying in 1776 that all men are created equal or endowed by their creator. And it takes us about 50 years. And people were like, wait a minute. Yes. Me too. Yes. Talk about the ultimate me too movement. It started right here. And then you start to see uh, all this come out and he becomes of course an important voice. And one of the things that's important to teach in U S history is the theme of reform. The United States has an unending string of reform. We are remaking and rebuilding this this culture so often that it's an actual thread in our history that we teach as a separate idea. And so this is the beginning of a lot of that reform movement, and that is part of the psychology of the American national character is reform. Okay, so let's get back to him. I want to say that he really only wrote about three books, and they were all autobiographies, but He did write a lot. Obviously, he owned his own newspaper. He wrote Mm -hmm. speeches. I mean, there are hundreds of things that he wrote. But uh, I feel like this 1845 narrative is probably the most wide read. It's the one that launched him into prominence, for sure. Yeah. He wrote My Bondage and My Freedom 10 years after this one. And in 1881, uh, of course, he's later in life, the life and times of Fred Rick Douglas. All of the time, he writes this written by himself and it's very important he puts this in the title and it's not because he wants to be redundant but because he wants to explain this is ethos i wrote this trust it it's real this is actually happening i'm a real person and yes i am a man i can write and if you don't get it subtly he tries to make it as obvious as he possibly can by looking at the title. So before we get into all that, Gary, do you want to talk to us a little about a little bit about his timeline? Yeah, I've got a few things that I think are, are really interesting if you want to look at how he is. Of course, he's born in 1818 um, as a slave, 
But in 1839, basically at the age of 21, he's going to hear abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison and Wendell Phillips for the first time. Of course, this will be enormously impacting on that. I've skipped past his his youth um, as a slave because we're going to get into that later on in the actual text. But uh, by 1841, two years later, he's speaking at abolitionist me- meetings in Massachusetts and And I want to point out, especially for those unfamiliar with American history, because we have international listeners, uh, they may not understand that slavery was particularly practiced in the southern states. And there were abolitionist or anti-slavery movements in the United States in the north uh, before the turn of the 1800s. So there had been a long-established tradition in some places of being anti-slavery. So out of his slavery experience, he finally uh, comes to the attention of anti-slavery societies, and he's an, an instant hit because of his ability to articulate uh, the, articulate the, the psychology of slavery and, and all kinds of things related to it. Um, by 1846, he is going to leave the country, and he's going to um, go to England, for safety, because he's becoming popular, uh, his supporters are afraid that his former slave owner may try to reclaim him in the North, because that was still unsettled in the United States during that time period. So- Wait, I want to stop that, because I think that really struck me as strange when I first read this book. So he's writing this book in 1845, and mm-hmm. he's telling people's names. Yes. He calls them out. He says... This person beat me. This person killed somebody. This person did this and did that. And he's still a slave. Anybody could have, tell me if I'm wrong, but anybody could have picked him up and hauled him back. And he would have gone right back to that farm. And it would have been that life is normal. Right. One of the great controversies between the North and the South before the Civil War, which is referred to as the antebellum period, was the idea of the fugitive slave law. As slaves began running away to the north in larger numbers through the Underground Railroad and other instances, the South pressed for a stronger fugitive slave law. Fugitive slave laws required northerners who came into contact with runaway slaves to return them to the South or the northerners could be fined or jailed. It became a huge point of controversy, and as compromises go on throughout the 1850s, the South wants stronger fugitive slave laws, the North is more resistant because the North is entrenching more and more, if not in abolitionism, at least in the anti-extension of slavery, which is where most Northerners really stood at this time period. Right, which strikes me as so crazy, because here's this guy. I mean, if it were me, I would just try to hide. And he does try to hide for a little bit. He changes his name a couple of times and all that. But to get on a stage and talk about your experiences by name, I mean, any bounty hunter could have easily found them. And this, of course, the bigger the audience, the more likely that you are to find some schmuck who wants to turn you in. All you have to do is need money. Oh, and there was, of course, and there's great hostility uh, out there. And, and the South had pushed through laws in Congress making it illegal to mail anti-slavery literature to Southern homes. And so here's here's Douglas, who's becoming the greatest piece of um, propaganda for the anti-slavery movement. And, of course, he would be extremely threatening to Southerners at that time period who didn't want anti-slavery propaganda being sent into the South. So there was incentive to try to capture him. So all that to say, it's amazing that he made it to 1845. And, of course, when the book comes out, he's not that crazy. He's out. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> right. And and he's going to end up eventually, when he comes back from England, oh, well, by the way, the, the uh, his supporters in England are going to raise the money to purchase his freedom from Which, his former owner. And I find really interesting the conversation, and I read some articles about this. The abolitionists in America were all mad at him. Don't let them buy. That's a violation of your human integrity. You don't have to buy yourself. You don't, uh, nobody owns you. You need to come back and stand up for yourself. And we see this throughout, you know, Frederick Douglass's life. He's like, well, that might be good and ideal, but (laughs) I'm not, you know, I'm pragmatic enough. I'm going to pay out, pay the money and not run that risk. (laughs) Right. And Douglass in his writing is always pragmatic. And I think that's a great point, great point to bring up. So you have the pragmatic person who's actually been the slave being scolded 
by the people who've never been the slave as to what's proper and ideologically the correct thing to do. And I really enjoy siding with Frederick Douglass's pragmatism. Well, I find it interesting. It's also insulting as a woman because we'll get into this later, but after a while when he realizes that the black man can get the vote and the white woman wasn't, you know, he said, bye-bye women, I'm going for it. Well, <laughs> the, indeed he did. But he, uh, there, there wasn't a, a schism that couldn't be resolved between him and the feminist movement. He did explain himself very thoroughly that this is practical. This has to be done this way. I'm sorry that this has happened, but we've got to get the black man the right to vote, even if it leaves the, the female vote out. And so he does promote that. So, All that um, to say, his pragmatism is important and it matters. It means, like, I want... To actually do something. It's not talk. It's real. And his pragmatism is what just permeates the writing. That's true. Constantly. And so it permeates the logic. It permeates the reasoning. It permeates the arguments. It's very important. So uh, moving on then, by 1848, he is going to actually attend the Women's Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, New York. The and we're going to talk basically. about that. That's our uh, yeah. our supplement, this this unit. We're not going to do a poetry supplement. We're going to talk about the Declaration of the Rights of Women after we finish talking about Frederick Douglass because he does support that, and we appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> and I want to go on to say that he's going to visit uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe at her home. She's the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, that book will be one of the major um, antebellum pieces of literature that really drive us towards the Civil War. As a matter of fact, when Abraham Lincoln meets Harriet Beecher Stowe, he said, oh, I'm happy to finally meet the young woman who started this great war. <laughs> so uh, he also has connections with John Brown. John Brown is a fascinating character on his own. He's he's rebel. He's Psychotic. <laughs> He's mentally yeah. ill. He's. All I've read kind of a things. lot about that, and I really think Frederick Douglass was on Team Brown, even though people have tried to distance for him. a while until John Brown actually planned the raid at Harper's Ferry, and then Frederick Douglass broke with him at that point. I'm not sure that Douglass broke with him because he was against violence against the Southern plantation owners, because I feel like he thinks that there are violent people. But maybe he was smart enough to realize this plan is going to fail, and I better cut my ties. Am I wrong? Well, let me say this about Douglas: what he did understand about Southerners. He understood that the power in the South was concentrated in the hands of a small number of people. The South was ruled by an oligarchy. The average white person in the South was not a plantation owner. They were not even a slave owner. And he understood that the reasoning, the people that he had to get to were the powerful white oligarchy in the South that owned the vast majority of slaves and controlled the economy and controlled the politics. Well, his association with Brown kind of got him in trouble, and he ended up having to run away back to England. (laughs) Oops for that. Yeah, not good. (laughs) But uh, he does campaign for Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln gets elected in 1860. The Civil War comes, comes in full range, and of course... He doesn't just support it with his voice. He inc- he recruits his two sons to fight. Yes, yes. Oh, there's this, some really touchy moments about his connections to the uh, Massachusetts 54th Regiment, um, uh, the first one of the first all black regiments raised to fight in the Civil War. It's just very moving stuff, all of yeah. it. Yeah. And he was a man intellectually, physically, emotionally invested in this this cataclysmic time period. Now, one of my favorite historians is Carl Degler. And Carl Degler says there are two things that reshaped the entire structure of the United States more than anything else. There's nothing that even compares these two these two events. Event number one is the Civil War and how it will completely reshape the social, political, economic, philosophical foundations of everything we are. The second one is actually the Great Depression which is not anything that Frederick Douglass has a connection to at this point. But I do want to point out, Frederick Douglass has a very direct connection to what Carl Degler says is one of one of the two absolute most crushing and reorganizing events in U.S. history, and that is the Civil War. 
Well, Douglas is called to the White House by Abraham Lincoln to discuss strategies for emancipation in 1864. And, of course, they realize that this isn't a simple thing. You don't just say, okay, ha-ha, you get to be free now. And, of course, the 13th Amendment is going to pass the next year. And this is a huge deal because in the North, there were abolitionists, and then there were people who were anti-slavery, two very distinct groups. The abolitionists were considered radical because, A, they want the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. B, and this is their radical point, they want the 14th Amendment to grant citizenship to the newly freed slaves. There were a large number of Northerners who were all on board for Amendment 13. The 14th Amendment was a much more difficult thing, especially previous to the Civil War. So the 14th Amendment is going to be a huge accomplishment during Reconstruction. And of course, he gets it. And Douglas is going to campaign for Ulysses Grant, who, as you know, is my favorite president. Which I still can't figure out why, (laughs) but you do you. (laughs) He wins the presidency in 1868. And of course, they pass the 15th Amendment which is when the women get all mad at Frederick right. Douglass because he said, you know, they tried to make a deal that Douglas, use your weight, say women and blacks or nothing. And he's like, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get black males the right to vote. We're going to secure that now because we can. Yeah. And after that, of course, he has several positions in government. His first wife dies. He marries a white woman, which, of course, becomes very controversial. But his first, I will say, his first marriage lasted 44 years, I think. Is that right? Something like that. So it was pretty okay. It worked. And then he married uh, the white, uh, his white secretary, which was controversial at the time. And then, of course, he ends uh, his life living there in Washington, D.C. And there was also a long-running affair with a woman from Germany. Oh, well, we're not going to get into that. Oh, okay. All right. (laughs) I mean... There is those small moments of, of, of whatever it is. Small moments of like that went on for over 20 years. But we digress. The point being that... I'm still in love with him. Well, th- there's no reason you shouldn't be. <laughs> the, the man becomes um, a rock star in terms of 1840s, 1850s, 1860s America. That's true. And he does, I cannot emphasize enough, shape the psychological thinking of this nation in many ways. He's buried back in Rochester uh, with his first wife, Anna, and the rest of his family. And, of course, we've taken our picture there because you and me both, we're both in love with him. Yes, we are. (laughs) All right, so that's his life. Uh, In a nutshell, of course, there's much to say that we can't say, but I want us to jump in into the story itself. Now, at the time that it came out, It was printed with um, two prefaces written by two very famous men at the time. You've already mentioned them. Wendell Phillips and, of course, William Lloyd Garrison. I kind of like William Lloyd Garrison better. I don't know why. Uh, But he writes a really long preface for a couple of reasons, and they're worthy of note. First of all, Garrison was kind of a father figure to Douglas, and I want to ask you to speak to this. The beginning of his story, he really makes a point to discuss how fatherlessness felt for him. He felt really disconnected with the world. He has no genealogy. Now, this is important with every other biography that you'll see. This is true pretty much across the board. Everyone talks about their origins. This isn't even in biblical text. If you look in the book of Matthew in the Bible, There's a genealogy of Jesus. If you look in the Old Testament, there's a genealogy of Moses. When you get to Frederick Douglass, he's making the parallel. I have no genealogy. Right. And it's an interesting bit of psychology to throw this in here because when we go into chapter one, that's the first thing he talks about. Um, He talks about uh, the rumor that his master was his father and the idea that he met his mother only a few times during his life. He was raised by a grandmother. And why that is important and why it drives Frederick Douglass um, is because of identity. And he can't, the, the idea that he can't really peg his birthday is going to be a source of, of trouble for him for his entire life. 
And why that's important, if, we're, if we can take a psychological moment, memory is not just for the sake of remembering where your car keys are or remembering what you're doing on Tuesday. Memory creates identity and memory gives you a spot in the world. Memory gives you orientation. And so here we have a man who opens his book in the very first page by talking about his lack of orientation psychologically because of the loss of these things. And that's important. And I feel like we're going to talk about this a little bit more. But Garrison is a mentor for him. It's a father figure for him in a way. I think it's the only kind of mentor that he actually ever has. And when Garrison gives him this four or five page introduction he's giving him some sort of orientation into the world this is who this man is and i really like what he says a few of the things that he says well basically if you're going to read the preface he says a couple of things first of all he says you can trust him these are facts and if you don't believe it he called them out by name go to baltimore and talk to those people yourselves what he is saying is indeed true because, of course, I mean, you can correct me historically how wrong I am, but a lot of the people were challenging the the stories that were coming out of the South. They were accusing them of being hyperbolic. No, there's a lot of slaveholders, but they're nice. Those people are happy. And, and this was the myth that was being propagated oh. to a large degree. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina wrote what's called the classic defense of slavery, where he lists all the reasons why slavery is a positive good. And that was widely circulated through the South. And so there was that bit of propaganda that they were at war with. Well, Garrison, that's one of his main points. He says, you can trust this. This is the real story from a person that has been there. And then Garrison sets out and he lists the way I enumerated it, there's possibly more, but about five things that he wants the reader to look for when you read the book. So he's trying to say, listen, this is his argument. Pay attention to what he's pointing out. And Garrison is going to say, there is a direful, these are his words, there are direful outrages that are a natural result of slavery. So slavery itself, because of what it is, no matter what you say about it, is going to have some very horrible ramifications. This is what Garrison is saying. And then he's going to go on to say, number two, it's not less cruel even if you're not physically cruel. So it's more than just the physical. There is more to it and you need to pay attention. Number three, you're going to have to get physical. He's going to say this, whips are necessary to keep people in bondage. You can't just keep them in psychological bondage. They'll figure it out eventually, and it is going to get physical sooner or later. Number four, he's going to say, when you abolish marriage, which is what they did in the South amongst the slaves, you're going to have adultery, concubinage, incest. These are things that are going to happen by necessity. So th the sexual nature of slavery is a reality that no one is talking about, but they should. Which is really bold for him to be discussing this in the 1840s. Oh. It's very shocking it to the public. It is shocking. And, it, and, it, and we're going to get into it in the very first chapter of the book. And then fifth, he says, when absolute power is assumed over life and victory, victims have no protection against the fury of their oppressors. So absolute power, you have nothing, and you will be a victim in a way that is absolute. So when he, sa when he says, read it and looking for these things, that's what we're going to be looking for. And he, right. of course, edited the book for, um, for uh, Douglas, but he doesn't really edit it very much. And he wants to make a point of that when he talks about it. He says, listen, I did edit it. But it's mostly his words. And he and even goes on to say, there's things that I would have changed. I don't know what he would have changed. But apparently there were things that he thought he left in because they sounded like Douglas. And he wanted his voice as an original voice to sound like Douglas himself. So that's Garrison's introduction. And that's the setup that the original reader would have had when they yeah. opened up to page one. 
Well, and one last historical thing about Garrison and Douglas, they eventually will break uh, with each other in their relationship. And the break is going to be over interpreting the Constitution. William Lloyd Garrison had gotten himself in trouble many times by publicly burning copies of the Constitution, claiming that the Constitution was a slave document. Interestingly enough, it's going to be Frederick Douglass is going to say no. The Constitution is brilliant in its anti-slavery statements. I want us to take it a minute about, and I don't usually go on to the present, but I think it's important because even today we have people that are are not respectful. I don't want to say maybe not respectful of the Constitution, but they don't think about the Constitution in that way because we think of our history and there's injustices that's happened here and there, and we want to blame you know, the people that live before us. And it's interesting to hear a voice from the past who mm-hmm. was a victim right. of some of the things that have gone wrong in our country to say, you know, there are things that have gone wrong, but I wouldn't have a voice if it weren't for this document that gave me a voice. Agreed. And that's what's so brilliant about, about Douglas and his observations in the Constitution. He said the Constitution is the way out. It's it's the salvation from slavery uh, and um, I, I think that's fantastic that he made that observation because when the Constitution was constructed, and I don't want to go too far afield here, but the, the Constitution was constructed with the ideology that we need to create a document that transcends current emotions, current trends, and governs for the long term. And so when we put in there things about rights and uh Freedoms. Citizenship and freedom and things of that nature. Yeah, the the writers of the Constitution understood there are freedoms not yet defined, but this Constitution wants to address them in the future when they come up. Well, let me suggest that Douglas clearly had the last word since nobody reads anything about Garrison except his introduction to <laughs> Douglas. He's, he's Garrison's <laughs> very important, but yes, he is very much overshadowed by Douglas in this instance. All right, I want to read. Uh, the beginning of chapter one, as I do on every book, because and I want to point out a few important things. I was born in Tuckahoe near Hillsboro, about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. Let me stop you right there. What's your rule on sentence number one? Tells the story. Okay. <laughs> the author's going to lay out his whole story in sentence number one. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen authentic record containing it. By far, the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs, and is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. And it's that sentence that I think gives us the hint of what this is going to be about. The idea of dehumanization. What does it mean to try to rob somebody of their humanity? And of course... That's what slavery is 100% about. And something that that Douglas will hit constantly and consistently throughout the book, the dividing line between the two groups, those in power and those oppressed, the dividing line is ignorance. Right. And he uh, that's probably one of the most compelling points he makes in his book. He doesn't really appeal to morality all the time or fairness or any of those things. He, he appeals to uh, literacy and ignorance, that that's the catch. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cheering time, spring time, or fall time. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me, even during childhood. The white children could tell their ages. I cannot tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. I was not allowed to make inquiries of my master concerning it. All right, if I were to count one, two, three, four, five, six, six uses of the word I and several uses of the word my, what's my point? This is a testimonial. This is the way that it really is. And he points out, I'm not special. Nobody right. knows. This was common. This is common. So he's going to bring out that his mother was named Harriet Bailey. She's the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of a darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. And he brings out this idea of color because that matters. And of course, He's going to talk about this throughout the book, that the darker you are, the more discrimination you were likely to experience. But his father was a white man. 
Now, of course, he doesn't know who his father was, and I don't think he ever knows. And historians have concluded that it may have been Aaron Anthony or maybe Thomas Ald, Anthony's son-in-law. But either way, he never, I don't know that he ever really knew exactly. Right. The who, rumors were all he were uh, privileged to have. Right. And here is where we were talking about, and he's going to get into this very quickly, the sexualization of slavery, that the idea that the master is going to have children with all kinds of people across the plantation was, of course, quite common. And in fact, there are people that say that would have been the natural death of slavery because eventually you would have had all kinds of of inbreeding around these farms, which is kind of what we had in Brazil. Uh, But in this case, he really hones in on the idea that to be a son of the master was not a good thing. And he points out that you're in a, a, a lose-lose situation because his wife would look at you and could see your right. lighter color and know what had happened. So you only had two choices. You either stayed there and he had to be harder on you to prove to his wife that he didn't like you or he had to get rid of you. And then even if those two things didn't happen, he said this. Um, the Well, in an ideal world... Things would go well, but at one point, your own brother, he would have to witness one son beating the other son. So, I don't know what to make of that. What do you think? Oh, that's a that's just a, a psychological double bind. I cannot even imagine observing half brothers, one uh, slave and one free, and one being beaten. They would have the, to know. So it just would create such a tension you couldn't resolve. So within two pages of the story, he brings out the authenticity of his voice, number one. He brings about, he's going to introduce this idea of the sexual nature of human bondage and the distortion of that. And then he's going to bring in this third element that I find equally compelling is that the sanctimonious religious nature of the arguments are are foul and he's going to bring up the religion part where he says god cursed ham and therefore american slavery is right so apparently in the south the white slave owner had used the bible as a justification for slavery to suggest that noah had three sons one of his sons got in trouble because he had witnessed his father get drunk and God had cursed him. And you can go read the story. It's in Genesis 9. And because God had cursed him, he'd set a mark on him. And so the slave owners had said, well, that mark was he was black. And so if you're black, you're the son of Ham, and therefore you have to serve the rest of us. And that was the justification that they used. Right, and that's part of the nonsensical reasoning that that Douglas is going to attack throughout the book. And it was amongst the ruling aristocratic class in the South. They did have a huge religious justification because you have to keep in mind um, the vast majority of slaves were owned by a small number of people, and so they did have a community where they had to reinforce this idea that it was okay to to, to own slaves, and religion was one way to do that. But it's really interesting because in this time period, Ralph Waldo Emerson has a great quote where he says, "If you put a chain." around the neck of a slave, the other end fastens itself around your own. And that's the point that he's going to try to make. The slavery dehumanizes the owners as well. Yes, and that comes out. So Aristotle, thousands of years before Frederick Douglass, says very authoritatively that your ability to persuade is based on how well that you can appeal to the audience in three ways. You have to appeal to what he calls logos, ethos, and pathos. In other words, you have to make a logical argument, you have to prove your credibility on the topic, and you have to make an emotional appeal. If you don't do these three things, you're not convincing. In chapter one, you're going to see the emergence of these three things. Right at the beginning, he's going to set out to establish his credibility. Then he's going to create his argument. He's talking about dehumanization. He's going to attack this idea of the religion embedded into the slavery. And he's ending the chapter with this amazingly 
compelling story of, uh, of a woman who he watches. And he says this. It wasn't an uncommon story. So there, his master had a, had a crush, basically, on the most beautiful woman uh, on the plantation. And she says she was a woman of noble form and of graceful pur- pur- proportions, having few equals and fewer superiors in personal appearance among the colored or white women of our neighborhood. And it was Aunt Hester. So Aunt Hester was the most beautiful woman on the plantation, and the plantation owner didn't want her talking to any other men. And of course she does. She meets uh, another slave on another plantation called Ned, and when he finds out, he whips her. And Frederick Douglass says this, there's no words, no tears, no prayers from his gory victim to seem to have moved his iron heart. So what he does is she screams loud. He had stripped her uh, just the top off and beat her. He whipped her to make her scream. He whipped her to make her hush. And not until overcome by fatigue would he cease to swing the blood-clotted cowskin. He's going to say this, I remember the first time I ever witnessed this horrible exhibition. I was quite a child, but I well remember it. I never shall forget it while I remember anything. It was the first of a long series of such outrages of which I was doomed to be a witness and a participant. It struck me with awful force. It was the blood-stained gate, the entrance to the hell of slavery through which I was about to pass. Wow, that's a lot of pathos there. But he clearly establishes the ethos and the logos. And that is our Frederick Douglass that we love so much. I guess that wraps it up for episode one. It does. Um, thanks for being with us today. This, as you can tell, is going to be one of our favorite adventures. So join us for our future episodes as we talk about Frederick Douglass and the narrative of his life. Like we always ask you to do, please check us out on uh, Facebook. And on Instagram, you can look at our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. I always like to point out that we have teaching materials there. We tell you how you can teach in a classroom with a podcast. And if you're teaching this book or the historical period, give us a listen. We'd love to help out with your educational adventures. But thanks for being with us, and we will catch you next time. Peace out.